Hello, welcome to um, Coffee with the Curator from uh, the Pacho Arts Council. I'm John Sino, I'm your host. And today I have with, with me Jane Hartley, whose work is at the Claire Davidson Siegel Gallery um, at the Pacho Medford Library. And uh, once a year, uh, Jay Shock, say hi, Jay. Hello, everyone. Jay is visiting with us today. He's the curator of the of the gallery there. He, he turns it over to the Patrick Guards Council, and we we uh, curate one show there every summer. So this year, we're very happy um, to have um, Jane with us. Our theme for the year has been clear vision, and certainly that. Um, that applies to the work that you'd see in the gallery right now, right? Jane's work is, is I don't know, it, it's realist of, is there a particular term you use to describe the realism in your work, Jane? Well, it kind of started out as classical realism and it's kind of morphed into contemporary realism. <laughs> okay, so yeah, well, it's it, it has a very Baroque tendency to it um, and, uh, uh, you know, and uh, we're going to ask Jane to describe it in a little bit. But first, we wanted to know a little bit about, you know, the artist herself. And um, Jane, by the way, is is not a local artist. She's currently living in Georgia. So you can tell us a little bit about um, your your background and how you developed into a painter. And um, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the paintings. Okay, well, um, I graduated from Maryland Institute College of Art, which is now known as MICA, and ended up getting a degree in graphic design because in those days you didn't even have a shot at making a living <laughs> uh, painting. So um, I went into graphic design for a lot of years and um, finally got out and realized I like, you know, I just needed to be on the creative end rather than the business end. And um, strictly by accident, I was asked to be in a seminar where I met another artist that I apprenticed with. And that's where I learned um, all of the, the marge techniques and the old master techniques because the person that I apprenticed with actually studied with Jacques Marge. So I had access to all of his um, original notes and formulas and, and that. And it's a really painstaking effort which um, I've outgrown and I go to easier methods to get right to the painting. But um, that's, that's kind of where I learned about uh, glazing and, and painting in layers. Um, and like that particular picture, when I first started, they said, we want you to copy, copy somebody good because I don't want you to worry about subject matter. I want you to worry about learning the technique. Um, and that's why I have some of these old master uh, representations in there. And that was strictly to start to learn to practice technique. Um, and then I kind of just took that technique and morphed into, most of that stuff was figurative work, which has always been a little bit of a struggle for me. So I went to still life and that's where I do most of my work now is still life. So when you first started working in still life, you were already work. You were you already working with that baroque sensibility, or um, I guess it was kind of just there. I really like, um, you know, the, like the sort of Dutch masters and uh, a lot of the the. Um, setups that they did um, on the, on the, um, oh, the Vanitas, you know, they had these elaborate spreads of tables, which indicated wealth at the time and the passing of time and that type of thing. And I got intrigued in all of that um, symbolism and that was kind of the style and it just kind of fit. And I think I fell in love with the, with 
the method, the, the glazing and what you could get. And I could see such a difference in the depth and the luminosity in the paintings when you actually look at them. And I think that's probably where my hang up comes, where I don't understand people that can buy paintings online without actually seeing them because there's such a huge difference sometimes. So, so uh, yeah, because I had been looking at these pieces online and then um, I had to, I had to go out to the gallery and pick them up by the way Jane's work uh, it she is represented by the William Reese Gallery in Southold, right? So I went out there to pick up the work that's in our show. And uh, because of COVID and everything, it's hard to, hard to really schedule to pick it up and get it to the gallery. So I brought it home and had it for about a week. And it was in this room behind me over here. And I was just, you know, it had, it wasn't normally the kind of work that I would have responded to. But I, when I was surrounded by those pieces, it was such a pleasure. I enjoyed it so much and they came alive they really do come alive when you see them because of the oil paint um the luminosity in the oil paint it's a, it's almost impossible to get that full feeling out out of the um you know in in, in a uh, image right so anyway um she, uh, Jane has worked on a number of different series and I'm going through some of them now, but the, the works that, um, that uh, are encoded messages all come from two series, the Flora, Fauna and Far East series. And by the way, you, you can all um, visit Jane's website, uh, uh, janehartley.com and you could see everything that I'm, I'm working with right here now. So, and, um, and the other was the messages of happiness. So um, uh, Coded Messages takes these two uh, series, works from both of these series and combines them because they're very related. So um, do you wanna, you wanna go to any one particular one to start with and to talk about it a little bit? Would um, you have a... Well, the starter was, was really the flora fauna Okay, so we'll go here and and which one would you like to open up? Oh my gosh, pick one. <laughs> well, I always, uh, you know, uh, okay. Um, uh, is the, la uh, the lady and the warrior? How about the lady and the warrior? Okay. Okay, because we already, we'll come back to Feng Shui blessing. All of these, uh, the thing about um, all of this was derived from um, still life being all about symbolism and telling stories and creating something that when people looked at it, they could kind of make up their own story if they related to it in a certain way. And um, just by kind of osmosis, um, I began to realize how much symbolism was in um was in the far east and chinese painting and um so the purpose of the series was to kind of uh relate eastern and western art through their shared use of symbolism which is all around us and the interesting thing about um the chinese is that they, they sort of had a very, very brutal history. And at different times, people weren't allowed to speak. And, um, you know, they were carted off to some place and never seen again. Sounds like and, today, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's very, 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 you know, contemporary. So um, what they did was they came up with symbols. And their writing is the same way. That's another um, another version of their use of symbolism. And so while we in the West used it for, um, you know, like in the, the Dutch paintings, the Vanitas, and it, it showed that transient of time and, and um, denoted wealth and prosperity, um, they used it to um, confer, 
all of it was more about happiness because I guess their lives were so miserable. And what they really wanted to do was give good messages. And so each of the paintings in here um, all have a very positive message. Um, and all the elements in each painting contribute to that message in some way. They all have a meaning that supports that message. For instance, in, in this particular painting, the message is about enduring love. And if you read the, um, the little fable that goes with it. So excuse me for a second. I just yeah. want to point out that if you were on her website, you would click on more info and it would bring up I think it's at the bottom. Yeah. Yes, an explanation for each of the um, each of the uh, pieces. So go ahead, you know, so other people oh. can explore at their own. So there's, um, you know, a little legend that goes with this that explains about the warrior and the lady and the symbolism of the poppies and the um, the little bee and even the the chops at the top of the painting. Um, those all have meaning that that supports that. Um, let me see if I can find this when you want to. And then the other part of it, um, and this is this is kind of where uh, messages of happiness comes in. A lot of these things would have blessings attached to them, um, which if you were to take somebody poppies, it would mean something special and to, to the person that you were giving it to. And they would automatically know it because of the use of symbolism. It gets a little tangled up. And I, I spent a couple years creating this series. And I have to say it was absolutely fascinating because I didn't know a whole heck of a lot about China and, and all of this. And it was just, um, I got lost for a couple of years while I was doing it. It was wonderful. Um, and the stories, the legends that I found that could be just, it was kind of crazy. It was like they were there all along and I didn't know it. And I was just kind of making up these paintings to be led to those legends, um, which it's kind of freaky, but um, I, you know, it was great. It means a lot to me. I mean, I look at these and there's so much more than just the painting. And so so do, you, do, you, do you recall the, the legend that went along with this? Uh, I know I, I read this one recently, so I have this one uh, in my head. <laughs> I know it's a yeah, lot of a well, lot to hold on to. There was um the lady was married to um this warrior, and that's the statue, and he was was quite a well renowned warrior and um she fell in love with him and when he went into battle she would follow and she would stand by him and always be there to support him. And um, one time he um, was surrounded and defeated and he became very despondent and she tried to perk him up <laughs> and apparently it didn't work. And um, she ended up when she couldn't she couldn't take away his sorrow at his defeat and his depression and all of that. She committed suicide. So it's a bit tragic, what you say? This, this one <laughs> has a bit yes. of tragedy in it. But, Operatic tragedy. But it happened that a cluster of poppies sprang up from her gravesite, oh. according to legend, representing her strength and her spirit. And the the bee which is in there um it flies away from is a symbol that flies away it's the soul and um i think they have it if it if it does fly into the mouth of the person the person will come back you oh. know from the dead so there it's you know it's a love story 
It certainly is. You know, the the thing that first, um, you know, looking at these uh, before I, uh, I got deep into understanding what you were trying to do with the symbolism, when I first looked at them, the thing that, that um, uh, excited me the most was the fact that instead of having a still life with objects that were you know, simply, um, you know, a, a collection of objects. Um, one of these is a sculpture. So it has a physical reality already before it goes into the picture as a work of art and artifice. And, and then the dish, you know, with the painting on it. So now we have we have a two-dimensional representation of the lady and a three-dimensional representation of of the uh, of the general, and they are both embedded in the painting. So there's art inside of art. You know, um, that's the thing that I I you know I first saw that that I was really interested in, and and you know um, Picasso in in the um, I guess it was 1911, in the year 1911, created Still Life with Chair Caning. And um, he was using multiple representations in a still life. So this kind of has a, 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 uh, uh, a, a resonance with, with some other kinds of things. Even earlier, Picasso uh, would put drawings inside a painting. So Part of the part of the work would be be a drawing that he then painted into uh, a painting. So there was multiple representations. So I really like that aspect of that, and it happens in a lot of these pieces where you use another work of art to help tell the story. You know, I I, I like that a lot. Well, I had a fun time collecting props. <laughs> fact, the State Department had me investigated because I was tracking too much stuff down in China. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and is there significance to the text in this one? Um, yes. Um, the left column at the top um, actually translates as lovers forever everlasting and unchanging, enduring as the universe, a solemn pledge between lovers that their mutual love will last as long as the mountains and the sea. And the characters in the right column um, are that of signifying a fair lady, a woman of means, a warrior, and a brave fighter. So ah. just kind of to, uh, mm -hmm. bring it all together. And the, the bittersweet in the background is a symbol of fidelity and it's used to repel evil. So all of these things kind of just support that whole. Oh, great, <laughs> great. So you want to look at another one? Why don't you pick one that you'd like to talk about? Um, we can stay in this series and then look at the other uh, in a moment. Which one would you like to, to speak about? They're, they're really beautiful. And uh, um, we have the two on the bottom in here. And uh, Peaceful Transitions and Auspicious Beginnings are both in the show. Not all of these are in the show. Um, about six of these are, I think. Yeah. No, or is it the, yeah, there's one, two, three. I recognize four. Is, did we get, no, we didn't get tight. We didn't get that one. I think four from this and six from the others. Is that what it is? Well, okay. what well, would you like to talk about? Feng Shui blessings or? Um, we can, I would say either one of the first two. If you want to do Feng Shui, we can certainly do that one. Um, I don't recall this. Is, is, is Safe Journey in that? Yeah, Safe Journey is in that, right? Journey. Okay. Yeah, that's a, well, that's kind of a, an interesting one, a fun one. Okay, um, well, let's let's see Safe Journey because I I have a baby pray, uh, praying mantid in my yard right now. Cool. So um, this this revolves around exploration and knowledge, and let me let me find this. Here we go. Um, the journey that, that is the story of this one is about a young man by the name of Wang Wang. 
and um, he uh, went to a mountain that was well known to train himself to become a master at a, a type of boxing called Shaolin. And they went there to, to study and um, train and all of that. Unfortunately, he um, wasn't real good at it. And um, he could not, um, he just couldn't raise his skill level. And uh, he was, he was kind of downtrodden. And there were times of the year when they would all break and go home. And he, with a bruised ego, went home to visit his family. And um, he was out walking somewhere near his house one day in the meadows. And he happened to see a, um, a cicada and a praying mantis fighting. And he was, he was kind of fascinated to see these two critters going at it. And he started to, he just sat there and he watched them and took a look at what was going on. And the mantis used his, um, he used his forearms <laughs> in a certain way. And so he went back every day and he studied these critters and watched them interact. And he took the manis and, and just spent a lot of time observing his behavior to the point where he developed strategies that he could apply to his boxing from watching this mantis attack a cicada and um it became you know he practiced these ideas he improved uh, you know he became a success at what he did and these techniques that he derived from watching the praying mantis became known as mantis style boxing and um it set it set the standard for for that type of boxing in their in their civilization in their and their um, in their culture and it was became known as kung fu boxing so that was the precursor to that so um, that journey is you know the struggles that you go through in life and you start at don't get defeated just keep going you never know. You never would know when your luck is going to change and, you know, things could work out really good. So the mantis symbolizes um, meditation and contemplation. Um, the candle is, uh, can symbolize claiming one's own identity um, and recognizing their talents and their power. Um, the teapot in Chinese culture signifies protection, um, and the pear is regarded as a, a symbol of immortality and prosperity. So that was his journey. So I, I, I you know, there's the little um, jewelry box. Is that what that is? It's um, it has all the small drawers in it. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you know, some of them are open and some of them are closed. That kind of is like, you know, to, you know, remind you of how you learn. You know, you open a door, a draw, and you pull some stuff out of it. You know. Well, it's the curiosity factor too. I mean, yeah. he, he, you know, it's just amazing what you find in certain places. Who thought the key to him improving would be when he took a walk and he watched a praying man as mm -hmm. you know, fight mm -hmm. with a cicada. You know? Right. Right. Well, cool. So um, let's Some of this might sound like it's a stretch, but it's kind of the way my mind works. I get kind of... <laughs> Listen, <laughs> you're the artist. You can, you can imagine them any way you want. So I was kind of thinking about that. And since you brought it up, I'm going to ask. Um, so you got this story, right, that you have read about. And then you put together the still life that goes with that story? Sadly, no. The weird thing about this is it worked just the opposite. Oh, yeah? 
Yeah. Um, I, and I can't explain that. <laughs> that's the, that's that creative leap that uh, that we we as artists are all allowed to make, right? So um, we saw Feng Shui just uh, Feng Shui blessing when we when we opened up. It's really beautiful. I love the color in this one, I and mean, it's it's just so uh, it's just so glowing. So that's an example of using that layering technique. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and usually what, I mean, the technical part of it is you use a lot of glazing and you can add subtle colors and they're transparent and um, it, it will create a, a depth. And you probably, if you were looking at the actual painting, could see it most in um, I would say the pomegranate, the background, um, yeah, you know, those type of things. Um, hmm. You just can adjust the tones and the lights and the darks and subtle colors rather than it's completely different than a la prima. So it's a lot more subtle than, than that type. And it's suited to very realistic work. And with my graphic background, I just was kind of going that way, whether I wanted to or not. <laughs> so let's see, what else, what else did we have? Uh, what else is on display from, from uh, this one? These two on the bottom, right? Uh, yeah. aus auspicious beginning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that one is about birth and hope and um there's a tradition in china about um red eggs that are presented at a baby boy's celebration party and the color red is is a lucky color for them and it um is supposed to protect the child against any illnesses or um, you know, evils, as is the tiger symbol. Um, that um, uh, is taken as a symbol that the tiger will protect the child from all evil. And you'll see it um, embroidered on their um, little booties and hats and clothes when they're infants. Um, and then the incense um, is, you know, to communicate with the gods that all good things will happen. And the orchid, um, the orchid is kind of a symbol of fertility and kind of the wish that, you know, may you have a big family and lots of, lots mm. of kids. So um, the, uh, that's what the red eggs are all about. <laughs> They're actually a symbol given to... And I thought that there was an odd number if it was a baby boy and an even number if it was a girl. Ah, okay. So if you ever get red eggs. <laughs> and peaceful transitions. Um, well, you don't have to go into all of them in depth. I just wanted everybody about, to see. Yeah, it. Life's, life's passages. So yeah. all of that has all of those things. I mean, you can read this stuff. It's just sort of more of the same. There's a- Right, right, right. So I just wanted everybody to see those and then I'll, we'll go and look at the other come from, and then we'll look at some of the others. But first, uh, the rest of the pieces in the show come from messages of happiness. Mm -hmm. And the only two horizontal pieces that were in the show came from this group. Right, um, and I remember this being one of them for four treasures, and uh, it's it, the four treasures are the are the the tools for, uh, for ink painting. Um, yeah, for calligraphy and writing, and and to have those skills was, um, you know, really important um, in moving up the ladder in Chinese culture. Um, 
blessings are a, an, an outcropping of um, the first one because they, they have this um, saying that there are five blessings, longevity, wealth, um, health and composure, love of virtue, and um, to die a natural death at old age. So um, this was about achieving wealth. <clears throat> and in order to achieve wealth in the Chinese culture, um, boys from prominent and wealthy families would go to a school to learn a variety of things. Um, and of course, one of the big ones was writing and calligraphy. And that's what all of this is about. The ink had meaning, the brushes had meaning, the frog has a special meaning, the stamps, the chops have a meaning. And um, you would work your way up through um, uh, through passing all these exams and it pretty much guaranteed that you have a very successful wealthy life. And um, the other thing is they would make these elaborate robes with Mandarin squares and the Mandarin squares were embroidered with symbols that indicated your rank in society. Um, and the wish for all of these was that um, that everybody be able to learn, educate, and achieve the most that they could achieve um, to have these blessings in whatever form they came. Okay. So, um, by the way, uh, not only are these available on Jane's website, but if you go to the Pat Med uh, library site, uh, Jay has an image of each one of the pieces that are in the show, and then it will click on to the explanation for for the for the pieces as well. So, what else did we have from? I think we might have missed some from the other series, but uh, what else did we have from here besides? Um, did we uh, lotus and nine coins. I think this uh, with the yellow lotus that was one. Yeah. Right. And that all has to do with um, prosperity and wealth. Um, the coins, obviously, the gold ingots. Um, the lotus is immortal, um, immortality. The scroll in the background has fish on it. And fish were always considered to be, if you could feed yourself, you were prosperous. Um, and I forget offhand what the coral have. It's probably under there under. Oh, yeah. Things. Well, let's look it up so everyone can yeah. see what you do. Yeah. <laughs> I'm restarting to fade here. So, 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 um, we can I look up that. and we oh, can see the William is. Reese gallery and you could look up some of the things that are in this painting over here. What was it? The coral? Oh, the coral uh, with red coral, yeah. branching red coral is a yeah. symbol of wealth and status. Look at that. We can all um, look at all of these and and find out um, some of the symbols in all of these. Now, um, so there are 10 pieces in the show. We looked at a bunch of them. And uh, there were some other series that were really intriguing to me. And I, I don't think you need to be like, as Daryl in symbolism, maybe there isn't, but um, a couple of them that that were intriguing to me. Um, well, there was uh, the pipe dreams, for instance. You, yeah, like, that, was, um, that was my first um, foray into creating series. And um, it was just by accident. Um, when we lived in Maryland, we were on the Eastern shore right outside of a town called St. Michael's, which is very historic. Our property had a cottage, a caretaker's cottage on it that dated back to the 1700s. And next to that cottage was an old shed that was filled with all kinds of really bizarre stuff. Not that it was all from the 1700s, but over the years, it was a collection of things. 
in a variety of tools and widgets and gadgets and stuff like that. And um, it was kind of like you went through it and went, oh my God, what is this? You know, some, and it's like, what kind of tool is this? And then of course there were all these pipes and do that and get spigots and stuff. Spigot city, yeah. Yeah, so I lugged them all up to the studio and started messing around with them and came across, and the series is about man's relationship with tools. And there's actually a progression to it. Oh, so and is this the first one? No. Um, nope. If you go back to the page of all of them together. Okay, I'll they're, do that. They're in progress. And I can kind of make this. Sorry, progress. I can't. Uh... Oh, there it should be on this page. Yes. Here. Okay. So. Which was um, first? Where where did you begin? The, uh, the clamp. The clamp. And in the beginning. <laughs> the clamp. <laughs> Sorry, it makes me laugh because we have a we have a funny story in our family about um, an episode of Lassie, and I don't know if it was real or not, but one of our friends was describing this episode of Lassie where Lassie had to get the C clamp. <laughs> you know, Lassie, get the C clamp. <laughs> So every time I see one, I laugh. I'm sorry. <laughs> Clamp in the next one, basic shapes. When man started out, he had a problem. He needed a tool, and he went for whatever the simplest thing was to fix it. Yeah, so right. These were these were not. They just kind of got the job done, and then as mankind continued and his imagination oh continued. so this is the beginning of man's yeah. use of tools <laughs> okay <laughs> and then um uh, and these next things are a series of basic shapes and pipes and you know things like that they were oh okay i see so we can go from here simple problems and that's why the paintings are simple and not complicated in and, the beginning, life was simple for man, and then came woman. Is that what happened? <laughs> no, she didn't get her tool belt until later. <laughs> um, then tools started to go from practical to um, press, you know, having some prestige. Um, and I picked these because they were colorful and they were fancy and um, trying to elevate the status of the lowly spigot mm. um, and then from there um, there's a neat quote that says men and women use tools are to celebrate their existence and transform them into art and really what happened over time um, you go back in history and you see the scabbards and the knives and they were encrusted with jewels and stuff like that they sort of had a status and then they became objects of art um and had value more than just accomplishing whatever their usefulness was and so i decided to make the do this design in um you know one of the old festoon the floral stuff right, yeah so so um you know the um, the nineteenth century, or was it the eighteenth century? Uh, two American painters, uh, Harned and Petto. Do you, are you familiar with them, Jay? Yeah. Jane, do you yeah. know them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know they they both had a very similar style where they would they would basically hang a bunch of stuff on a door and paint it. <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> you know that's what. I, yeah, they'd be interesting uh, to look up. Yeah, but there were a lot of there were a lot of floral paintings um, in that time in a time period where they were hanging bouquets. Only they were flowers and not too. Yeah, it's, they would also hang like turkeys and stuff like that. Yeah. You know, any you know, uh, yeah, and rabbits. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. And then the next one is is like a, a takeoff on a classical, what they call classica natura morta, which is a, you know, Italian still life. And then that was sort of that phase. And then when we go from there, um, 
civilization, the industrial age. Ah, uh, yes. Then. See now, and, I'm, now I'm starting to think cyber uh, cyberpunk with these last ones. So, um, you know, it's it's new needs, new desires, and it starts to affect um, the changes in our landscape. You know, all this use of tools and building and commercial spaces and chewing up mother nature and building and so the last three are kind of like that that's what spigot city is building you know civilization this is sort of industrialization um factories and um the more and more people you know we developed we started to um alter the balance in the world and that's why these all these empty pipes are here and the birds are like oh what happened yeah. <laughs> and it's um there was a quote from a man by the name of pete hamill who was a curator for the heckinger collection which was full of tools and it says um the world that lies ahead the scary earth of the 21st and 22nd centuries jammed with un uncountable billions of people. The trees and grass are gone. The oceans poisoned and dried. The doomed inhabitants slaughtering each other over food, if water or belief. If that's what awaits us, mankind will not be saved by tools and art. We won't so, be saved by tools and art, huh? Yeah. So yeah. You, I, I, I feel like, you know, you've got this whole story arc in these, and it reminded me of Thomas Cole's... Uh, like the course of empire, you know, it starts in <laughs> in the bucolic beginning, and then it, you know, it has its heyday, and then it crashes. Right, um, unintended consequences. <laughs> yeah, very good. And and the other series that you know, thank you because I didn't, you know, I've looked at these, but I didn't know those explanations. I thought that was wonderful what you just said about these pieces. So the unfortunately, the only way I know how to go backwards. In Zoom, you know, I'm in two things. I'm in Zoom and your website at the same time. So uh, let's take it the back. The other one, Pipe Dreams, um, you know, was, I mean, uh, not play. Yes, right. It's coming in not play <laughs> because. It was an offshoot of, um, you know, knots are one of the oldest tools in the world. I think they predate man. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, okay, this was, I can explore knots, you know, because it's oh, cool, yes. right? You so, certainly can. Um, this got way more complicated than I ever thought. There's a lot of math in it. It's like- Yes, there is. History. And it just, it got to the point where my brain just didn't work that way. <laughs> and I thought that I, I'm gonna have fun with it. And you know, the play on words where people go, oh, why not? And not- Right, 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 yeah. Well, this is the this is the series that is a gift that keeps on giving. I've got one on my easel now that I'm working on called Not in Bloom. And the whole series is just a play on words. On and, the word not, yeah. You know? Yep, I've had a lot of fun with it. Um, is there any one particular one you want to look at or... There's so many, they, uh, they don't seem to progress like the others. No, there's no progression. It's all just, um, and in fact, the title should come up so you can see one. Um, right, so wh like, where would you want to start? Oh. oh, I see. Oh, not accountable. So that's the pun. You have a pun in the title. Yeah, they're all, they're all, all the titles are based on knots. And this is based on, um, uh, different cultures used knot tying to keep account of things and they were called quippas the incas used them a lot as a method mm -hmm. of counting so um normally it was for like sheep and chickens and hens and bales of wheat and that type of thing and so i just did a take off on that um, well that's pretty cool to know wow i'm amazed I i'm fascinated uh, um um, the balloon one is called Not for Kids. Not for Kids. 
Um, right. So this doesn't have that Baroque look to it, though. I think no, it has to. You know what? It's the same <laughs> technique of painting. Right, right. It's the all, color is you know, different, though. It's like glazing, but it's a whole different sort of vibe. Yes, right. Well, it's time it, to drop all that heavy stuff. Right. You know, so anyway, you know, anecdotally, when I was an undergraduate student at, at Stony Brook, both Jay and I are alumni, um, I was making not sculptures. Oh. And I was fascinated with the idea that knots were both um, incredibly organized and or totally chaotic, right? And we use right. the same word to describe something that was totally chaotic or something that was totally organized, right? So I was I was interested in the idea of entropy and all that kind of stuff. And I was making knot sculptures. And then while I was making knot sculptures, the Stony Brook, uh, you know, you know, the math department had a joint symposium with the religious department, and it was all about knots. Mm. <laughs> you know, so I ended up doing a show called Not What, and, uh, you know, it was, uh, you know, so anyway, knots are very fascinating to me, and, and there are all sorts of knots in this, in this series. It's natural knots here, not music. So they were grapevines that, yeah. they make their knots in nature, nest mm -hmm. and, you know, vines and that type of thing, so that's... That's what that was. And I, I thought that that sort of looked like it reminded me of musical, you know, the notes and the. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. Don't. <laughs> yeah, it has, it has a, a fluidness of music to it. And where did I go here? The. The, the knot here is the oh. knot hole. Ah, uh, everything is in part, <laughs> except for the pear. Which is hanging from a knot. Yeah. Which is hanging from a knot. And, and that was right next to this one, another one that was this one, right? This is like a De Chirico, right? You know, uh, George De Chirico work? No, he kind of lost me on that one. Oh, so he was a proto-surrealist in the early 20th century. And um, he used, he made sculptures that included um, like classical busts, you know, and oh, okay. pieces of classical sculpture in it. And then he would put them in like with a train driving by or something like that, something modern and something really old. So they were uh, anachronistic. Yeah. Yeah, well, this was actually just based on knots in prehistoric time. There are these old statues that go back, I don't know, 30,000 years. Oh. Mm -hmm. um, that show female figurines that decorated their body with these knot-like ropes. Oh. And I just was like, I'm going, oh, how many times have you heard the expression, oh, my God, I'm just tied up in knots. <laughs> you know, my butt feels like it's tied up in knots. Yes. So that's kind of where that came from. But, you know, talk about unintended consequences. I got some criticism on that, that people, their, their thoughts immediately went to something like bondage. Mm. <laughs> and so it's, just, right. well, it's amazing well, how people, you know, see things. Well, you can go in the complete opposite direction and say that this is this symbolizes the yoking of womanhood, you know, like the keeping down uh, uh, of women that uh, the male patriarchy has done for so long. How about that? Yeah, I didn't even think of that one. Well, listen, I can come up with a lot of them. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the great thing about painting. I, I, you know, I love it when people can look at something and interpret it in the way that it means something to them because then it's more than just a painting. You know, it has meaning. It's got a story. Hmm. Well, this has certainly been fun. Uh, uh, Jay, do you have any thoughts before, uh, you know? Um... Yeah, sure. Uh, Jane, thank you so much for all that. Hey, thank you guys for having me. 
Um, I had a quick question. If we can go back to the... You think I could do this, Jay, now? Come on. I hope, I hope so. Go ahead. Tell me, where do you want to go? <laughs> uh, maybe to the some of the works that's on display. Maybe like the... Okay, we could do that. One, we didn't look at this one either. Happiness. Okay. Um, um, flora and fauna work. Yeah, whichever one. Because the the arrangements, oops, uh, the arrangements are so um, meticulously composed. I was wondering, how did you come to if we maybe if we do like the the warrior one? Um, they seem so meticulously composed. I was wondering how you came about these arrangements. Like how how was each work composed? Was it over a series um, of times, a series of contemplations? Actually, um, I'm trying to think of a good way to explain it. Um, there's not always a method to my madness. I will collect things. I have a huge prop department and a great big table to do my setups on. And I will just start pulling out stuff and monkeying around with it and changing backdrops and um, getting some kind of arrangement until something starts to click and something starts to happen. And uh, oftentimes, I mean, it could take me weeks to come up with one and then I could get one done in a day. It just falls into place. And it's, it's mostly just what kind of pleases me and I see what I can weave out of it. Um, I, I'm trying to think if I had anything specific in mind when I started this and I'm not sure that I did. Um, I might have had, I had this statue and I had this plate and I might have started looking up things like, like what do those you know, the statues, the terracotta warriors. And I would go and I would look that up and I would start to read things about it or stories. And then that would lead me to add, throw something else with it. Um, and I think that's how those all came about. Um, feng Shui blessings. I didn't, I didn't really know exactly what that meant and what it meant to them, uh, the Chinese culture. And so the more I looked at it, um, uh, you know, the pomegranate and the grapes and the oranges all mean something. And I'm going, oh, wow, that's a bowl of fruit. You know, so I'll put a bowl of fruit together and then, then what do I do? And um, then I had this little brass fish and I started to look into more of the meanings of things and then just got the props and fiddled around with them. And um there's some that I started out with. I have the out, I have outtakes of photographs that I use because they just didn't come together, right? And and then you kind of mush them around with a little artistic license and hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> They're really I I literally wander around um, in this and I let my um, my imagination and my storytelling kind of take over. And sometimes I go off completely like, oh my God, what am I doing? You know, it's just really weird. Um, and I have to bring myself back. But sometimes it's just pushing stuff around forever and forever and forever. And your eye sometimes will tell you when it's just not right. And then if I can't get it right, I'll use a little artistic license. <laughs> so... But, so you do, you don't have any like you know compositional um, like you know like requirements in your works. It's intuitive. Then you just build I up the still so life. I think that's what my graphic design background gave me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm I'm very focused on composition um, and how the and the lines of the piece. I'm very two dimensional. Right. Well, this one is very strong, and it's almost like it's almost like you got the golden mean working in there with the division of the left and the right with the black line down the center. You know, um, 
I don't know whether I you can tell you if I do have it, it was completely by accident. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, but you know, most people say that, you know, we tend towards those proportions anyway. So yeah. we obviously weren't trying to make it symmetric. Right. So when you go off center, you find a place that it feels right to be off center. Yeah. So Although you did have you did have, you know, you say you don't know anything about the golden mean, but wait a second. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> right. I have to go back to view archive. You know, no, I have to go back to one more. And then. Fibonacci code. <laughs> yeah. There's this one. Yeah. yeah the golden right. So yeah. what, what is that? Where you don't know anything about the golden mean? Well. <laughs> Um, you know, it started with the shell. Yeah, yeah. And um, then I went, hmm, I remember some reading something somewhere. <laughs> and, um, you know, it, it's amazing how math and art are so interwoven. Um, and I, I have some of uh, Aristides' books on that, and she shows a comparison and the mathematical diagrams in some of the old masters mm -hmm. paintings and it's like phew son of a gun but um um so that you know it kind of fascinated me it's mm -hmm. everywhere in nature i mean it's right. amazing so I did, apply it more to my paintings <laughs> <laughs> some people are very rigid in the use of the you know those proportions in their composition and yeah. like clay and and uh, sarahua but um, yeah, you know, not every not a, you know. I think when when people first find out about it, they like to use it just because it's something new and to think about. But then you tend to use your intuition more. That's well, kind of a starting point. I think I think really though, mine's more about the stories. I I guess I just well I can tell you yeah. my head. You know, yeah. is there a story in this one? More info. This oh. I don't know. Let's see. Let's see what's down there. Nah. Yeah. Nah. Oh, no. It doesn't get a story. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Now, Jane, I know you used a very like traditional 17th century Baroque style of painting with like the hand ground pigments and the lead prime mm -hmm. paint. Um, I know Vermeer, they're always saying that Vermeer used like a camera obscura with his paintings and some of the Dutch used do you use a camera obscura or something similar to get like that really realistic um, depiction of the objects that you paint? Um, no. No, wow. No. Uh, Jay, uh, you know, uh, people in the 20th century and 21st century have real cameras. They don't have to use the camera obscura. <laughs> yes, but, but to get it onto a uh, <laughs> do you use a projection at all or I have yeah I will use projection because of sizes but that is not um, not what I work from if I if I blow it up to get the size that I want I give myself um, markings and just for the placement, but then I actually end up going back and doing the drawing to size. And that's where I'll start making refinements to it. Um, this, the one with the leaf coming out of the paper, um, literally was brown paper I taped up to a door in my studio and then went out in the yard and cut something. And so I could, and it was life size. So I could sit and draw just from that. Um, so it's, it's a combination of things. And sometimes I will use a photograph to find my mistakes in composition um, when I'm working with my setup. And I'll, I'll see that something just doesn't make sense and it has to be moved a certain way or, or replaced. So, like I said, I'm not very good in three dimension and, and always seeing those things. Um, and it helps also if you can flip, do a reverse, um, flip it horizontally so you can see the balance. It's like looking at your painting in a mirror to find the mistakes or holding it upside down to see where you went wrong. Um, 
So I'll, I'll do that. And, uh, but usually I, I've never gone from a photograph right to painting in a projection because I usually make changes to whatever I'm, I'm working from because they just don't work out right. So I end up doing a sketch and then I transfer that to the canvas with transfer paper. So. Very well, um, yeah. uh, Beth, did anybody have any questions? Is Beth out there? Oh. <laughs> I just got a text message from Beth saying that her computer is just froze up. Oh. So we can't get any messages from her. Okay. <laughs> okay, sorry, Beth. <laughs> you can hear her beeping away in the background on my phone. Okay, well, everybody, thank you so much. Um, Jane, would you like to... Um, would you like to have any closing remarks? Um, well, this is the first one of these things I've done. So You've done a great job. Um, and I really appreciate you all taking an interest in my work. I um, feel very lucky and um, I appreciate it very much. Well, it's, it's really a pleasure. And, and um, uh, I, I recommend that anybody who has a chance, if you get to Patchogue, um, uh, the library is open mm -hmm. and you can go into the gallery and see these works. They are really beautiful. They're worth, they're worth a, a, a trip into town and there's some lots of exciting things you can poke around in when you come to Patchogue. So if you don't live in Patchogue, uh, you can kind of make a little afternoon of hopping around it's a lot of fun and do go to the gallery and we have a show up in the art council as well too so um that would be good i do want to thank somebody um mary cantone who um turned me on to jane's work uh mary is the director of the william Riss gallery and, in southold and uh, i really really appreciate uh, the introduction she gave me to you and um all of her work uh, is on sale from the uh, from the uh, William Reese Gallery. If you are interested in it, boy, oh boy, my phone is beeping away. So um, that's all for today. Um, uh, next week I'll be coming back with with um, Eileen Palmer, and we'll be doing part two of women artists and. Um, uh, I'm afraid we probably could have done part three, but I, I think uh, we're going to we're going to do one more and I'm taking off August. Uh, I've uh, done one a week for, since the beginning of May with some great people. So uh, I want to thank you all for participating, Jane, Jay, for having me, Mary, uh, for uh, introducing us, Beth, for being frozen in your computer somewhere and unable to comment, but setting us all up all the time. I really have enjoyed all of these talks and um, oh, there's one more left next week. So everybody have a good night. John, thank you so much, Jane. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. All right. And thank you all for stopping in. Okay, I'm going to close it down now. All righty. Okay. Thanks, John. Thank you guys so much. Nice to meet you, Jay. <laughs> nice to meet you, too, Jane. John, great show. Okay. So okay. excited to have it. So you know what? I think you can stay on for a minute because the only people on are us. <laughs> Usually it's difficult because there's like lingering people and Mary is here, but we're okay with Mary because she's part of the team here. But um, usually like there's four or five people who are still on. Yeah. And I hope Beth has shut off the... <laughs> I think we're still streaming on Facebook. Uh, Beth, <laughs> shut us off so we can have some uh, chat afterwards. <laughs> yeah, so it was fun. Thank you. It was a lot of fun. Really Thank informative. You. Yeah. Yeah, really great. Okay. You know what's, you know what's nice is, um, you know, people like you keep this stuff going in stupid times like this when we all, you know can't get out the way we would like to so um you know you guys are to be commended for that yeah yeah
I'm just happy we opened in time for people to see it in person, even if. Oh my gosh, yeah. It's like, we produced, <laughs> like we opened pretty much early July. I wasn't sure if we were going to have the first month purely virtual, but I'm happy that people were able to see it like yeah. this time. Yeah. You know, the work is so impressive digitally, but it's even more impressive yeah. in person. Like all the little details. I always have coworkers saying, oh, there's like a little water drop on one of these oranges and it looks so <laughs> realistic. And, you know, those are the things that doesn't translate well on a digital platform, but, you know. Well, it means a lot to me to hear you guys say that. Um, yeah, and 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 the oil paint, you know, the 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 light that comes through the paint is just so fascinating, you know. Yeah. You know, it's something that's been lost when people went to acrylic. <laughs> you know, yeah, that's really, yeah, Think it's amazing. Oil, oil paint, you know, if you put them side by side, oil paint is just you get so much more luminosity and detail that acrylic or temper doesn't really. No. I know yeah. how long does it take because I, I always hear that oil painting takes so much longer to dry oh yeah how long like I don't know if you can ballpark it how long would it take you to make like a finished work of art with all those layers on those on that canvas um once it's once I finished painting it um there's some paints that dry slower than others do and it all depends on your I mean, it's just the chemical process of it, but um, usually I can varnish it within maybe three weeks or a month. It's like as soon as nothing smears, you know, you can kind of like varnish it. And, and if you don't do it then, then you have to wait for a while, like six months. And, you know, it probably took me four months to paint it. So. I don't want to wait that long. Yeah. But um, I don't know. It's um, just something I gravitated to. I mean, John, it's like you working with, you know, hand tools and it, it's a laborious process, but it's mm -hmm. what you do, you know. Yeah, I think there's something, you know, there's there's something in the the sense of time it takes to make make something you know i know it's it makes it harder to sell you know at any any anywhere near worth the value but it's also um you know um people recognize the the mm -hmm. the amount of attention that was put into making it you know so um well i i gave up i don't paint to sell. I mean, I'd like to sell. Right, right. Good not... thing Mary shut off. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, you know, it just it just can't be my motivation. Right, right. It can't uh, be, you know. Because yeah. I'm, I'm always out of sync with what's, you know, people are buying. Right. But that's yeah. it. Well, you make your work and that's what's important. And, yeah. uh, and you know, and I say an you know, artist is the person who can't help but make their art <laughs> you, know? You, you know and it's like and i know i know people there's one fellow in our in our hometown who like like maybe five or six years he came to me and said john i want to know about making art i want to you know and he makes like these you know like really fast thrown together you know uh, he'll 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 even use marbleized paint you know paint boards and stuff like that and mm -hmm. and and um and uh people respond and they like what he does and 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 you know everything he could sell things for three hundred dollars you know that you know you know but I always say that three hundred dollars is the patch hog limit <laughs> you know, in, in our in our town. <laughs> right. A little harder in patch hog, but right, right. That's you know because because <laughs> people have bought stuff for about that much, but um, you know, so so people who make things fast and can just slap stuff together right. and they seem that's to do a whole okay. different. I mean, that's a whole different mindset. Yeah, it's a whole different kind of art. Yeah. Right, right. 
So, right. I well, don't know, we, it keeps me out of trouble and off the streets. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. I I have found myself like on a Friday night. You know, um, I'll I'll be intending to go out to hear some friends play music or something like that. And uh, I go to my studio first, and it gets to be eleven o'clock, and it's like, oh, I think yeah. I'm. A, it's going to be hard to go out now, so I'll just <laughs> close up. You know, and I end up spending three hours in my studio on a Friday night. Oh, nice. That keeps me out of trouble. <laughs> There you go. <laughs> Jane, I had one more question. Um, sure. Where does the framing process, like where does the, the, the frames, because they, they appear so intricate, like an integral part of the artwork, do you think about the frames before the work is done or do you finish the painting and then you find a frame that kind of fits it? Um, I don't think about the frames when I'm doing the artwork. Um, kind of because the artwork should just, I made a mistake in the very beginning. I fell in love with the frame, framing, the moldings, right? So I had all these very ornate frames on my paintings and I, it got to be like um, jewelry. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I realized that you can't depend on the frame to do anything other than not take away from the painting. Don't fight with it. It should complement it. It shouldn't be the focal point. The painting should be the focal point. And I just, um, I had to outgrow that and it was trial and error. So um, I'm kind of into simple is better. And that series, I was just starting to try and simplify. Some of those might have oriental hangers on them. Some of them do. I think two of them do on the, on the top. Yeah. yeah. That was something I thought would be, oh, wouldn't that be great at the time? And now I look at it and I go, oh, what was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> you know, but that's, that's kind of the fun thing because you realize you can look back at some of these and you go, sometimes I go, wow, I can't believe I did that. Mm -hmm. And it's a good thing. And then other times I say that and it's a bad thing. And <laughs> um, it just, so that's good. You keep growing. Right, know? right. So you do, you've done that and right. it was, it was okay when you did it, but it's not where you're going to go. Right. Yeah. You know, it's funny because the artist that I had mentioned, he actually is a carpenter and he started making frames out of smalted smalted maple and, and cur you know stuff like that and and his frames were more important than the stuff that he put inside them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. very interesting very and are interesting. these still active series that you're continuing to add to or are you on to a new new kind well, of one? once you um, feel like it's a natural progression or um, no, actually, right now, like I said, I've got this, um, one of the knot series on my, I mean, I have a box full of ideas for knot paintings mm -hmm. and all kinds of sketches and stuff like that. And I always figured if I ran out of anything, I could always, you know, I could always go back to that because they're just a lot of fun, you know, so, um, but I don't have any particular um series that i'm kind of coming up with we've recently spent a lot of time in costa rica over the past few years and have some land down there so we've been down there a bit and it's kind of really taken with the just you know the flora and the fauna and have tried to incorporate some of that just just a change of pace and but it's not something you can sink your teeth into and keep going, um, you know, like a no-brainer. Then after you've done a couple of those paintings, you got to think of something else. But yeah, one of the but, one of those other paintings looks like um, uh, where was it? This one. Oh yeah. Well, that's cool. That that's a Costa Rica painting, huh? That's a Costa Rica painting. That's a <laughs> And, you know, this flower is the first time I ever saw one in, you know, its natural habitat and not in a florist. Um, it's like, wow, they're really spectacular and big and rubbery and, <laughs> and everything. And in those pockets that come out, uh, all kinds of critters hang out. And I thought, well, I'm going to turn this into a hotel. And I made up the stories about the inhabitants of the 
hotel and <laughs> gee I, we, I, we should have shown that one that's pretty yeah. cool yeah, yeah each of those each of those little guys is a character um in you know the hotel um like i think this guy is a doorman and this is the uh the waitress in the bar and um then these are all you know different clientele that come to the hotel every year and then the blue morpho butterfly up there these are all birds from costa rica by the way ask, yeah. yeah yeah so i you know got all these birds together and, <laughs> and um, i love the story <laughs> yeah well right? if you go if you yeah. go under more info it's, it's yes fun. you'll see it all there names. well yeah. i i wish you know jay you asked great questions uh, we could have had those um some of those were, would have been interesting to share with everybody. I still feel like we're still live on Facebook. Well, it's just the three of us now. So, uh, <laughs> oh, you mean live on Facebook? I yeah, think, because I don't know if we're still streaming or if, if the thing is just frozen. But I know. Well, you guys had such a good flow, and I know it got muted. So I'm like, I'm not gonna interrupt. But but yeah, this is this has been a lot of fun. Well, good. It was easier than I thought it was going to be. Because <laughs> I, I kept telling John, I'm not an upfront person. I'm a behind the scenes person. So I was stressing a little bit about this. I think it's so important, though, especially. <laughs> when... I got old. Beth was wildly texting me with things I was supposed to say. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, I am. Uh... Well, you know, I try to say as much as I can about what's coming up and what's going on, but uh, right. that's the hard thing is just promoting. But um, yeah, you know, that's when you need somebody to write copy for you. So you just get this thing and you say, okay, you read all of these things off when uh, to make sure you don't forget a anything. Right at uh, the end. Yeah. Um, but I think like these these conversations are so important. Even like that more info, like that added text, especially with these works, like. I think that's one of the things where you go because we are a library and, you know, art, you know, it's not the, I don't know if it's the primary focus of the library, but we have art on the walls and we might not be attracting people that typically go to a gallery or a museum. And I think by adding like that extra information or going to like these virtual programming, it gives you a whole other dimension and a whole other layer of understanding the art that you see. Because of course, like these works are very aesthetically pleasing and very realistic, so people can relate to them, you know, innately. But once you read, because we do have the text out there too, once you read it, I think you really do take a better understanding of what you're looking at. And I think like mm -hmm. these talks, like I think the talks were so important to hear like your words and how you express these paintings and how you came about it was so uh, enlightening for, of course, me but uh whoever attended the program too well i hope so <laughs> <laughs> there's more than meets the eye yes yeah so. yeah it was great it was yeah. great so thank awesome. you so much jay and jane yeah, yeah. i really thank appreciated it yep yeah. okay thank okay, you so